A jury in Texas has handed down a nearly $50 million judgment against him, $4.1 million in compensatory damages, meaning what it would take to cover the plaintiff's actual damages in the form of therapy bills and so on, and $45.2 million in punitive damages. The damages awarded to punish a defendant and defer deter future misconduct. The punitive damages award may be reduced as Texas has a punitive damages cap of 750000 per plaintiff. There are two plaintiffs in this case, so that would be $1.5 million. Though the plaintiff's attorney, Mark Bankston, has said he will challenge the constitutionality of that damages cap if necessary here. A jury awarded the sums after sitting for a trial that was all about damages. Alex Jones's liability to the plaintiffs was settled last year. After Jones so continuously refused to comply with discovery mandates, court orders, and basic rules of litigation in the liability phase, that this judge, and two others, by the way, issued a default judgment against him, finding Jones uh, in contempt of court, stating that nothing had worked thus far to force Alex Jones to comply with the court's many orders and concluding that he had forfeited his right to a trial on liability. This particular case in Austin, Texas, where Jones's InfoWars is based, was filed by Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis, the parents of six-year-old Jesse Lewis, who was murdered in his first-grade classroom at Sandy Hook Elementary, along with 19 other first-graders and six adults, on December 14, 2012, 11 days before Christmas. I covered that mass shooting that day while live on the air for Fox News Channel. I was then pregnant with my third child, Thatcher, who would be born the following summer. I remember getting ready for the show as the news broke and my executive producer knowing I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old and was pregnant with a third child called me to prepare me for the job that was ahead. This is going to be a bad one, darling, he said to me. We had covered many mass shootings before, though nothing Nothing would prepare me for the horrors of Sandy Hook. I remember I called one of my closest friends, Janice Dean, who would later become godmother to that as yet unborn son of mine. And we cried and we watched the preliminary reports of the death toll rising. And I asked her, how am I going to do this, J.D.? How can I go on the air and do this? And she assured me that we would get through it and that I would, I would, I would keep it together because the audience needed me to. And that is what happened as I sat on the air for hours that day reporting the shocking, awful details as they came in. Two months later, Neil Heslin testified before Congress. And I was on the air that day too. We intended to take just some of his remarks, but as we watched Neil, our team realized there is only one thing our audience needs to hear from us today, and that is the full testimony of this man, a gun owner who had serious questions about how this evil shooter was allowed access to an AR-15. Questions we're still asking in this society, not, not necessarily about guns in general, but about how did he get access to AR-15, an AR-15. How did the parent, how did the mother allow it? Uh, Neil's testimony that day was passionate, it was honest, it was raw. And here's a bit of Neil describing what he had learned about his son's, Jesse's, actions in class that day. Stated by several of the surviving stu- students that Jesse yelled, run, run now. His fatal shot was in his forehead. Dick went in right at his hairline, exited directly behind that. Jesse looked at coward Adam Lanza in the eyes, saw his face, and he looked at the end of that barrel. Jesse didn't run. Jesse didn't turn his back. <clears throat> that was a fatal shot that killed Jesse. I later met Neil. I had him on the show. I got to know many of the Newtown or Sandy Hook families. I always felt a connection to them because of my own experience covering them on the air that day and the many follow-up interviews and pieces that we did on them and with them. I came to know Neil Heslin as a gentle, kind soul, a soft-spoken, thoughtful man who was never consumed with bitterness, but instead wanted to do justice to his young son's memory and to honor Scarlett, too, and her relationship with their son. 
It was that Neil and Scarlett who just won their case against Alex Jones. The lawsuit they filed was for defamation. Because, you see, Alex Jones had a very different reaction to Sandy Hook than most of us. Instead of offering empathy for the families, he called them liars, crisis actors, and accused them of being part of a government conspiracy. He said it over and over and over again for years. And Alex Jones had a very big audience for those lies, some of whom began harassing the grieving parents as the alleged perpetrators of a hoax. One woman was sentenced to five months in prison for her death threats against another Newtown dad, Leonard Posner. Leonard's son, Noah, who was the youngest of the Newtown victims, he had just turned six three weeks earlier, had his jaw blown off by the Sandy Hook shooter. Leonard opted for an open casket so people could see what was done to his baby. Alex Jones perpetuated the lie that Leonard was a crisis actor and it faked the death of his son, Noah Posner, too, is suing Alex Jones in a different court. The ongoing harassment, death threats, accusations, and horrific lies about them and their dead children eventually led several of the Newtown parents to file lawsuits against Alex Jones, claiming what we all, while we all enjoy a First Amendment right to our, imble- our beliefs, repeated lies impugning the character of another, have long been recognized as unprotected speech. That's why, by the way, Johnny Depp just won a defamation claim against Amber Heard. She claimed she had a First Amendment right to say whatever she wanted about Johnny Depp. A court and a jury in Virginia found otherwise. And the same lesson was just provided to Alex Jones. Of the four cases filed against Jones, this one in particular held a personal interest for me. Because it was connected to my own interview of Alex Jones, I sat down with him then while at NBC News for a lengthy profile. You may remember there was considerable backlash to my doing that interview at all. A small minority of the Newtown families objected to our, quote, platforming Alex Jones, an objection shared by many, particularly on the left. Bill de Blasio attacked me. Brian Stelter had the nerve to suggest that no one would ever appear on any show I would ever do again. And the left-wing press was generally apoplectic about it. For the record, though NBC News would not let me publicly defend myself at the time, the truth is that the vast majority of Newtown parents were either openly in favor of that interview or had no objection to it, though you would never have known that from the way the media covered it at the time. Very few of these so-called journalists attacking me for doing this piece stopped to defend journalistic principles like, we don't only get to interview the good guys. Diane Sawyer interviewed Charles Manson and Jeffrey Dahmer. Mike Wallace sat down with the Iranian Ayatollah and the head of the KKK while he was wearing a hood. People considered those huge gets. Alex Jones has unquestionably said some outrageous and offensive things, but he has not killed anyone. (laughs) The controversy was based more on the fact that I, was sitting down with Alex Jones as a former Fox News anchor now at NBC, something many on both sides of the political aisle resented. After all, several major publications from the New York Times to the BBC to HBO, Esquire and CNN had interviewed Alex Jones before my sit down with him and after his claims about Sandy Hook. And there was zero objection about platforming. The amount of incoming we received for that interview was overwhelming. I'm not going to lie. It was extremely stressful for me. I had I had people even on the right who I liked giving me a very hard time for doing it. I was on the cover of the National Enquirer as the world's most hated mom for doing that piece. A woman named Kristen Lemkow, a senior executive at J.P. Morgan, and it turns out a far left progressive activist, pulled J.P. Morgan's ads from the show in advance, saying she was repulsed by our decision to interview Jones. I'm repulsed by you, Miss Lemkow, and your moronic understanding of what journalists do, along with your egregious misjudgment of what that interview would ultimately mean for Alex Jones and the Newtown families. At no point did I ever consider not airing the interview, nor to its credit did NBC News. When I traveled to Austin, Texas to interview Jones, it became very clear that he had not backed away from his claims that this was all a hoax. He claimed that he had just wanted to examine, quote, both sides. 
Both sides, he said, the belief that Sandy Hook happened and the belief that it hadn't. But Sandy Hook did happen. And Jones's suggestion that there was any evidence to the contrary was and remains a pernicious lie. The whole thing is a giant hoax. How do you deal with a total hoax? It took me about a year with Sandy Hook to come to grips with the fact that the whole thing was fake. I did deep research, and my gosh, it just pretty much didn't happen. At, at that point, and I do think there's some cover-up and some manipulation, that is pretty much what I believe. But then I was also going into devil's advocate, but then we know there's mass shootings and these things happen. So again... But you're trying to have it always, right? No, I'm not. If you wrongly went out there and said it was a hoax, that's wrong. But what I already answered your question was, listeners and, and other people are covering this. I didn't create that story. But Alex, the parents, one after the other, devastated. The dead bodies that the coroner autopsy. And they blocked all that and they won't release any of it? That's, that's unprecedented? All even, of the parents the decided reports. to come out and, and lie about their dead children? I didn't say what that. Ha what happened to the children? I will sit there on the air and look at every position and play devil's advocate. Was that devil's advocate? It, the whole thing is a giant hoax. The whole thing was fake. Yes, because I remember in even that day, I'll go back from memory, then saying, but then some of it looks like it's real, but then what do you do when they've got the kids going in circles in and out of the building with their hands up? I've watched the footage, and it looks like a drill. When you say parents faked their children's death, people get very angry. Yeah, well, let's, oh, I know, but they don't get angry about the half million dead Iraqis from the sanctions, or they don't get angry about all the That's illegals. That's a dodge. No, 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 it's not a dodge. The media never covers all the evil wars it's promoted, all the that big things. That doesn't excuse what you did and said uh, about Newtown. Uh, uh, you know but it. I, here, here's the difference. Here's the difference. I looked at all the angles of Newtown. Hmm. Once I was back in New York, I knew we needed a response from the Newtown families, so I asked Neil. Typically gracious, he agreed. And in a gripping exchange, he made clear... What had happened to his son that day? I lost my son. I buried my son. I held my son with a bullet hole through his head. I dropped him off in 904. That's when we dropped him off at school with his book bag. Um, hours later, I was picking him up in a body bag. Alex Jones and Info Wars responded to that interview by doubling down on their lies about the Sandy Hook parents, including Neil by name. They claimed it was impossible for him to hold his dead son, Jesse, because the medical examiner they claimed had not released the bodies or some other nonsense. All lies. An InfoWar employee, Owen Schreier, admitted on the stand that he had failed to check any of these facts, though Alex Jones claimed it was all fact-checked, before saying these lies on the air. And those lies told about Neil... After our interview, after Alex Jones listened to Neil talk about holding his dead son, formed the basis for that lawsuit that just resulted in a $50 million judgment against Alex Jones last week. Here is the New York Times Daily podcast called The Daily this morning. What was the specific claim of defamation against Jones from Jesse's parents? First tonight, our report on the incendiary radio host, Alex Jones. So years later, in 2017, Megyn Kelly was profiling Alex Jones on a show that she had on NBC. For years, Jones has been spreading conspiracy theories, claiming, for instance, that elements of the U.S. government allowed the 9-11 attacks to happen and that the horrific Sandy Hook massacre was a hoax. And Neil appeared on the show to provide the family's viewpoint of the lies that Jones had been spreading all of these years. I dropped him off in 904. That's when we dropped him off at school with his book bag. He told Megyn Kelly about his last moments with Jesse. Hours later, I was picking him up in a body bag. He had gone into the school in the wee hours of the morning on the night of the shooting and he held Jesse's body. 
I lost my son. I buried my son. I held my son with a bullet hole through his head. This was obviously a pretty sacred memory to Neil, and he shared it with Megyn Kelly on the show that evening. And how did a defamation suit come out of that? What did Jones say? Alex Jones was unhappy with the way he was being portrayed in Megyn Kelly's broadcast that night. And after the broadcast aired, one of his sidekicks, a guy named Owen Schroyer, went on InfoWars and said that Neil couldn't have held his son that night because according to official reports, which of course conspiracy theorists had picked through and parsed and cherry picked, the families, quote unquote, weren't allowed to see their children after their deaths. Hmm. Jones later picked up on Owen Schroyer's false claims and amplified them. And that was the genesis of the defamation lawsuit that Neil and Jesse's mom, Scarlett, filed against Alex Jones. On the stand at trial, Jones was caught in several other lies as well. For example, he had earlier testified under oath that he had absolutely no texts on his phone about Sandy Hook. Neil and Scarlett's lawyer, Mark Bankston, knew different. As we learned in this moment that few lawyers will ever get in their entire career. You're ordered to turn over any text messages between Sandy Hook, right? Yes. And you didn't have any, right? Not that we could find. And did you know that 12 days ago, 12 days ago, your attorneys messed up and sent me an entire digital copy of your entire cell phone with every text message you've sent for the past two years, Mr. Jones, in discovery, you were asked, do you have Sandy Hook text messages on your phone? And you said no, correct? You said that under oath, Mr. Jones, didn't you? I mean, if I was mistaken, I was mistaken. Jones skipped many days of the trial, perhaps to avoid hearing Neil and Scarlett testify about the pain his comments had put them through, the renewed death threats, the danger, the harassment, the renewed need for therapists' visits, and the post-traumatic stress rearing its ugly head again. Though it's clear that Alex Jones was at least watching the trial because he was commenting on it on his show every day, and after watching Neil Heslin testify about what happened to Jesse, this is what Alex Jones said on his program that very day. He's a nice man, and he's not an act. He is um, being manipulated by some very bad people. But I'll just say, because i got to be honest, he's slow, okay? And his ex-wife is not. I don't think he's stupid. I'm just saying he's, he's... I've got family members that are really smart in a lot of ways, but they're just real kind of quiet and have this way about them, and, and, and they, they, they move at a different pace. Like, they're fast in some ways and slow in others, and he's... I mean, I think Hanslin acts like somebody on the spectrum. Okay, so he's on the spectrum. <laughs> There's something wrong with this man. There's something wrong with Alex Jones. He went on to try to dismiss his many comments about Neil Scarlett and the Newtown family. He says, just, well, you know, it's all unintentional. It was unintentional. Watch. I never intentionally tried to hurt you. I never even said your name until this case came to court. Uh, I didn't even really know who you were until a couple years ago when all this started up. The Internet had a lot of questions. I had questions. And over that six, seven-year period before I got sued, or six-year period, It's clear, you can see the whole progression of us, the few times we covered it, trying to actually find out what happened. One day, Scarlett took to the stand, and when it appeared that she had finished with her testimony, they took a break. Only then did Alex Jones show up in the courthouse. This was an incredible moment because Scarlett was not done with her testimony. 
And Scarlett and Neil and many of the Newtown families have long wanted the chance to address Alex Jones right to his face. Incredibly, Scarlett got that chance. She was poised and she was amazingly restrained. Having a six-year-old son shot in the forehead in his first grade classroom is unbearable, unbearable. You don't think you're going to survive. But there are people that have. And, and then to have someone on top of that perpetuate a lie, a lie, that it was a hoax, that it didn't happen, that it was a false flag, that I'm an actress, and you get on and you say, oh, sorry, but I know actresses when I see them. Do you think I'm an actress? No, I don't think you're an actress. No, you can't talk right now. Sorry. I, I, I did. I asked him a question. You, can, you get to testify right now. You're under oath. Nobody else in the room is. Mm. Scarlett was later seen offering Alex Jones a bottle of water. For, for the cough that, that he had. Neil Heslin actually shook his hand. What a man. What a difference in character between these men. I, believe it or not, I was almost at this trial. Neil and Scarlett's lawyer told me that they needed me to take the stand to get the NBC News interview into evidence. They wanted to play it for the jury. I will tell you the truth. <laughs> I was not excited to do this and really wrestled with whether I could or should. This whole story, every iteration of it, has been personally and professionally painful. Did I really want to leave my family, travel to Austin, Texas, take part in this insane trial with an out-of-control defendant, and subject myself to a hostile cross-examination, not to mention relive a difficult time in my career and a chapter of dealing with Alex Jones that, frankly, I would rather forget? No. The actual trial day that I was to be called, the day I was going to be called as a witness, happened to be scheduled for the same day of Thatcher, that third child of mine, his ninth birthday party. Not his birthday, but his birthday party. And for the first time in my 12 years of motherhood, that would mean I'd be missing one of my children's birthdays, one of their birthday parties. I had never done that, notwithstanding the fact that I've been a busy working mom. I knew that it would likely stir up a shitstorm of negative news stories from the left and would also not go over well with the right. Some of which has come to really embrace Alex Jones more recently. Some think of him as a martyr for having been deplatformed, another event that happened shortly after our interview. But the bottom line was there was no world in which I was saying no to Neil and Scarlett. I'd be missing my son's birthday party. They have missed every birthday of their sons for 10 years. Thanks to this evil shooter who murdered 20 first graders, including Jesse, in 2012. I might get bad press. How about reading over and over again online that you faked your sweetheart's life and death and then having crazed lunatics threaten to kill you for it? This whole thing is insanity. These lies about Sandy Hook are insane. And by the way, Alex Jones has been telling lies like this about 9-11, about Oklahoma City, about so many things and innocent people. We could spend all day talking about it. I agreed to go. I booked my flights. So did my lawyer. And then, miraculously, I didn't have to do it. Mark Bankston told us that the InfoWars team had screwed up and inadvertently their testimony had led to the entire NBC News tape being admitted into evidence. I was not needed and I was relieved. I was happy for Neil and Scarlett and I was uncertain up to this very moment whether I should say anything at all publicly about it. There are some to this day who write to me asking me to apologize to Alex Jones for that interview. They think I sandbagged him because he released a partial tape of me pitching him the interview, saying it would not be a hit piece. Partial tape. On the stand, too, he and his team claim I somehow set him up, making him renew his Sandy Hook claims that he really, really 
didn't want to do but for the big, bad, mean Megyn Kelly making him. The truth is, I told Alex Jones from the start that Sandy Hook would be part of this interview, that we would go over the controversies, but that I wanted to cover more about him than that. And that's exactly what we did in the NBC News piece, which is one of the journalistic endeavors of which I am most proud in my career. No one made him spew these conspiracy theories, but himself. He jumped willingly and recklessly into those defamatory claims about the Newtown families, which he now finally admits were false. He admitted it under oath at this trial. This judgment is morally correct and beyond past due. Alex Jones, yes, in his own way, a talented, compelling, sometimes, sometimes on other issues, weirdly correct, entertaining force. He is in independent media, has hurt too many people too many times. I am happy for Neil and Scarlett. I am relieved the jury punished Alex Jones. And I hope anyone who sees this as a free speech issue goes back to look at the law and the history of this case. He is hurting people. He is not actually sorry, though he claims to be now. This is not about free speech. It's about one man violating the law with impunity over and over and over again. Hopefully, that ends now. If you're like me, you're growing more and more concerned about the future. The market is all over the place, and inflation is at its highest level in 40 years. Interest rates are skyrocketing. Market experts not only predict a recession, well, some say we're already in one, in one, but they're using scary terms like economic hurricane and unprecedented. Now, if you want to protect your future, call a precious metal dealer I trust, American Hartford Gold. They can show you how to protect your savings and retirement accounts by diversifying your portfolio with physical gold and silver. All it takes to get started is a short phone call, and they will have physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or inside your IRA or 401k. And they keep it simple. They are the highest rated firm in the country with an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied clients. And as an exclusive offer for my fans, if you call them right now, they will give you up to $1,500 of free silver and a free safe on qualifying orders. So don't wait. Call them now. Call 866-518-2955. 866-518-2955. Or you can text my name, Megan, to 65532. Now that's spelled M-E-G-Y-N. My mom said it was like O-B-G-Y-N. M-E-G-Y-N. Text M-E-G-Y-N to 65532. All right? That's calling 866-518-2955 or text M-E-G-Y-N to 65532. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.